So, um, Helen, tell yes. us a little bit about uh, the early years at uh, in the Women's Studies program at UNL. I was not there at the very opening of the Women's Studies program. It began in 1976 as a formal program. It was finally approved by the university for both an undergraduate major and minor. And a crew of women had started work on it, uh, started teaching some courses in the early 1970s. Probably the first of the courses was called Women in Contemporary Society course that I was hired to teach when I came to the university in the late 70s. So I have a very strong connection with that course and with the program itself. In the early years, the directors of the program were essentially volunteers. We didn't receive any compensation for the work we did. We didn't receive any time off from our regular responsibilities. But clearly, this was a, a passion that people brought to their scholarship, that they brought to their interactions with their students. Um, we were exploring feminist pedagogies, we were thinking about different forms of feminist theories and who were the people who would come into the program and bring their knowledge and understanding and their connections with students into the program. So it was a very exciting time, but it was, for the most part, make up your mind what you think would make a contribution and move it forward on the basis of an all-volunteer group of faculty and students. That was a strength. Many people looked at us as we became more nationally known and were surprised at the fact that we had no women's studies faculty members, no one was hired into positions within a department. We were a volunteer program. But in many ways that gave us greater flexibility. So we invited speakers from around the country to come and join us and talk about this disruption, eruption that was going on within the academy. And that was a very exciting part of the process. So we would bring in speakers like Jermaine Greer and Bell Hooks and Pat Hill Collins and Angela Davis and so many different perspectives on women's lives. And that made it very dynamic. Most of us did not graduate from a women's studies program. We had no formal training in women's studies. We might have had a few courses um, as these were being developed in the early 1970s to mid-70s. But it was, it was a challenge to do the work. In my own situation, my doctoral program, one of my faculty members automatically flunked me on my comps because my doctoral comprehensives because his rationale was that women's studies was just politics, not scholarship. So we had these indicators that even though we were moving into academic positions, that it would be contested. It would be contested ground. Um, Annette Kolodny talked about it as walking through the minefields of academic work. So for us, collaboration with not only other faculty on campus and students and student groups, but also within the community was really crucial to the growth of the program. So I remember opportunities to 
link with the Women's Journal Advocate, the newspaper that was published from the early 80s to the early 90s. And many of our women's studies faculty wrote articles for those, for, for the newspaper. But at the same time, there were students and there were activists and there were advocacy organizations that were writing as well. But that became part of our scholarship. We understood that what was being written, what was being talked about in the Women's Journal Advocate was the stuff of women's studies. It was the experience, the range of experiences that we were going to be working with in our teaching and in our research. So it, w it was a very important part of the growth of the program. Other elements, other aspects of it were connecting with uh, programs in the community. Uh, when I was Women's Studies Chair in the early 80s, I had no idea how to be a program chair or a director of a Women's Studies program. I knew how to organize a conference, I knew how to teach classes and work with students, but I wasn't prepared for students coming to me as director of the program with stories of sexual abuse, of domestic violence, of quid pro quo harassment by other faculty members. And so learning how to work with that, not only with students and faculty members who are experiencing this, but also recognizing that there were resources in the community where we could go. So in 1980, I took my training at the Rape Spouse Abuse Crisis Center. And it made it possible for me to do something when I was director, more than say, well, here's Susan Brown Miller's book on Against Our Will, and, and why don't we read this together and analyze it made me a better advocate and a better, I had more capacity to refer students and faculty to the places where they could get help. That's not a typical uh, department chair activity. <laughs> yeah. Although later when I became chair of the Department of Sociology, it was very helpful to me. Many of those skills that I gained in women's studies really contributed to that. The program also had a, an internal dynamic that was both invigorating and exasperating, in that we had representatives from all different philosophical approaches within women's studies or within feminist theories. So we had our Marxist feminists and our radical separatist feminists and our let's look at sex roles and the impact on adolescent males. And so everyone was coming to the table with uncommon interests but a common bond in terms of addressing women's position, the exploitation, oppression, the social structures, the internal dynamics that go on in any uh, field of study, but also within any work organization like a university. So it was it was a strength, but at times it was very personally difficult to understand how we would be able to move forward in any particular endeavor. But we just moved forward. We just worked through it. Uh, if we were bringing in Mary Daly and there were concerns about, you know, too many white women and too many radical feminists, then we would 
bring Pat Parker to come and talk her poetry. She actually brought women from the community together who read her poetry. I remember Movement in Black being spoken by members of the larger community, the university community, in a very powerful way at one of our conferences that brought poetry alive in a way I had never experienced. So it was, it was a wonderful place to meet and grow with other feminists in, not only in the university, but in the Lincoln community. Can you talk a little more about, you mentioned uh, disruptions or eruptions in the <laughs> academy. <laughs> what, what were you up against? What challenges? Oh, sorry. I'm glad that came while you were asking a question. <laughs> okay. I'm going to lower my chair. I'm feeling very tall. It can be lowered. I thought I turned this off. No, no, Siri. This we is are a complicated. Can call. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, why I, that's a good question. Did I turn mine on? I don't carry one. <laughs> yeah, I see the point. Oh, I've never been able to figure that out. Oh, okay. I'm I won't so lower sorry. it. Sorry, that's okay. I would help you, but I've tried so many times. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, maybe I can because uh, I'm short. I have to put it's, my it, feet up. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Ch chairs aren't made for. Um, People my height, they're made for the average male. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, the disruptions, the challenges, the obstacles yes. um, that you faced, you know, the climate, um, those kinds of things. Part of the joy of women's studies was that we had this opportunity to meet and focus in a way that doing individual scholarship doesn't bring. And so we would meet in, not only in our formal women's studies meetings, but groups of us would meet to talk about issues that faced not only the university campus, but the larger community at large. And so you would have events that would ignite or spark a discussion, uh, action, outrage, articles in the Women's Journal Advocate. Um, I'm thinking of one when the Nebraska bookstore was in a different location than it is now. It was uh, facing campus. And we were having an event, uh, a women's studies event, and when we walked past the bookstore, they had put out a display of a murder mystery with a woman in a bathtub, a mannequin in a bathtub with blood all over the place and knives and all. Um, it was quite disgusting. And so, of course, we gathered around and decided that this would take a, a response, um, recognizing that the bookstore was a place where every student would go at that time. No online books. You had to physically go to the bookstore and, and purchase your books. So when there were those types of events, we gathered our strength from the fact that we had no university funding, we had no university resources that could be pulled back if we made too much noise or if we were um, political. When Mary, Mary Daly came to speak, she conducted her radical spinning theoretical presentation and at the close of it many hands sprang up lots of commentary people wanted to make and Daly looked at the crowd and she said as usual when I speak the first people to put their hands up are men and I will gladly entertain questions from men but I will answer the first question from a woman 
and there was a silence as for some research shows that women respond by gathering their ideas after a presentation or at the conclusion of a presentation and some men are more likely to pick up a particular piece within a presentation and want to make a comment about it throughout the entire discussion or lecture. And she was quite right in that it took a little while for the women in the audience to either gather their thoughts or think about the context of other people in the audience who would hear their questions and what might be the impact in their own home department, in their pre-tenure position as a faculty member, whatever that might be. We did get some blowback about that later, that it was very rude and it made one administrator very uncomfortable. He was you know, not happy about it at all. And our position was always supported, of course, by academic freedom, but also by the fact that really there was very little they could do to sanction us. We had moments when there were budget cuts and some legislator would say, well, we should get rid of these fluff programs like women's studies. And as soon as they turned to the budget, they would recognize there is no budget here. There is nothing that can be cut. This is an all-volunteer effort. And that was, in many ways, the strength that balanced the lack of resources. We had ourselves. And that seemed to be an impetus, an opportunity that we took advantage of many times. Sorry, can I, I just, there's one technical thing I need to adjust. Okay, we got video, and we're good to go. Okay, so, so Therese, one of the elements we were talking about is this notion of having a volunteer mm -hmm. women's studies program within a university that clearly values having majors and minors, having students who have access to the scholarship um, at UNLV now. I'm so sorry. Yeah. There's this window. Oh, okay. okay. So Last should I thing. lower the shade? I can do it. Okay. Don't worry about it. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm going to come in from this, this way. So sorry, I didn't want you to get going and be like five minutes into it before I just said, oh, okay. Lower that shade. You might, yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's an awkward angle, isn't it? Is that going to be enough? Or do yeah, you need to share it's it? Just a, the shades make it less harsh, more of a, a distorted glow that looks better. Okay, so now all I have to do is move this over again. <laughs> uh, it's a challenge being a star. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Sorry, I'm going to do this too. Okay. And that sun changing just changes everything up. Okay. Okay, looking at Jerice, I think we're good. <laughs> okay. So, talking about being a volunteer program and not having resources and what does the university value? Right, and in any university setting, particularly in a research university, mm. the dynamic often comes to value equals how many resources you bring in and how many resources are returned to you. So we made a decision as we were 
moving through the program and making decisions about how are we going to govern ourselves, how would we make decisions, how would we move forward, how would we grow the program, that we would rotate the program chair or the director's position on a fairly regular basis. We eventually came to a five-year span with the expectation that that would give someone an opportunity to really contribute and learn about how the faculty and the students and the graduate program operate and then move that forward and then pass it on to another person. What we discovered was that at the end of those five years it became obvious that they needed another volunteer at the university to run the major and minor and to have the women's studies colloquia and to bring in not only national and international speakers but concerts and other activities and events that really benefited the whole university campus. So at the end of every five years we would sit down and with the current chair make a series of push items to go back to the dean and say we need this in order to get the next chair of the program to agree to do this. So the first push was for space. We didn't have an office. The women's studies program when I was director and when Moira Ferguson as the founding director, we held everything in our little department office. And so that might mean meetings with graduating seniors, it might mean meetings with the full faculty, <laughs> unless we could find other space on campus. So first we pushed for some office space, then we pushed for some support, uh, a little bit of money to fund a speaker series, and then, do you want to stop? Sorry, I just thought I heard someone up there. It was. There was a young man who um, poked his head. Yeah, it's my brother. It's not supposed to be. I told him not to come back. <laughs> he might walk in through the back door. Unless he left, but she should have done. <laughs> yep, he's leaving. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Brothers. Brothers. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Gotta love him. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> so we would we would take the volunteer component and push it with the idea that if you want the energy and the dynamic contributions to continue, we're going to need to build. And so we would build each time. And some directors were very um, good at negotiating within the formal bureaucratic university itself. Others were much stronger at doing community connections and projects. Others were much stronger at working with the student groups on campus. And it allowed us to take advantage of the different strengths that these women brought to the program. And over time, we were able to institutionalize women's studies in a more direct way. It's still a very small program in terms of the actual number of faculty who are assigned to it, but it's very large in terms of the number of faculty who affiliate and who contribute, who make presentations on their research, who bring their students into feminist research projects. It's, it, it has allowed us to grow in a way that's a little different from some of the programs that started off with a big office and a full-time director and faculty lines. Um, to me, it gave us a solid footing that we had been able to historically and interpersonally work through the dynamics of 
different forms of feminism, um, what happens as we grapple with transnational issues, as we have develop a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, minor, how do, how do we work with that in a program that is in a very hierarchical and authoritative university structure? You, taught, you mentioned community engagement and what you, what the program and what the program director can get from the community to help the students. I, I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about how you give back or other ways that you know the program is engaged with the local community. Much of that is um, through faculty members who conduct their work their scholarship, their teaching, their research with their students in a wide array of arenas. So um, we have faculty and students who have worked with um, the Lincoln Literacy Programs and who are actively engaged in working with immigrant populations coming into Lincoln. Some of our faculty members and students actually represent these immigrant populations and so they come into women's studies with a transnational interest and know that there are many ways they can connect back into the community. Um, certainly in the movement of our students through our program who then go on to uh, work in advocacy agencies, uh, whether they're working with um, poverty, housing, homelessness, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, um, legislative policy issues, we can see that those connections are not just the connections of academic degrees but are connections of day-to-day -day work. They return back into the research, the, what our students are learning, what we're teaching in the classroom. And so that collaborative, cooperative process is very important to us. We've had students and faculty working on policy recommendations that they then represent to the legislature. And they have very practical experiences that come out of that. Uh, we took a group of students when uh, the pay equity hearings were being held in the early 1980s. And I remember a particular senator from an unnamed region of the state who um, wouldn't allow any woman to speak until he knew her marital status and whether or not she had children. Wow. Now, those are illegal questions to ask in a job interview, but clearly in the political process, reflected how he was going to take in information about pay equity. And at the end of this very long series of sessions and you know materials that were being presented and the committee was deciding whether or not to move forward legislation on pay equity the response of the senators was well this all seems to be very important but we can't afford to pay women what they're worth that was a very powerful statement to our students that nothing was going to come easily, that knowledge without action, without engagement could not move these issues forward. Um, those, those are the benefits of being in Lincoln, in the state capital. Um, they're the benefits of having a very active community structure. Um, we've drawn on, I mentioned the Women's Journal Advocate before, um, many of our students and faculty were actively engaged with the Lincoln Legion of Lesbians when it was 
um, a very progressive, dynamic component of not only the women's studies program, but also the women's community in Lincoln, common woman bookstore, many of these, you know, platforms from which students, faculty, staff could engage with activism. Well, wow. so I, I wonder if you could just say a few more words about the Lincoln League of Lesbians and Common Woman Bookstore. Sure. Uh, the Lincoln Legion of Lesbians was uh, a group that was in existence when I came here in the late 1970s. Um, they, a number of faculty at the university and a number of women's studies students were actively engaged, but so too were women in the community. They um, participated in the debates going on within the community at the time over uh, gay and lesbian rights, uh, discrimination in terms of employment, uh, gay marriage was not even on the horizon at the time. It was very much about um, the capacity to live in your own home and not be removed by a landlord who was homophobic uh, or not lose your job. Um, those are still guarantees that we don't have in the city of Lincoln. Um, they were very active in working with the development of the Common Woman Bookstore, which was uh, in place in Lincoln for a number of years and was a gathering place. It, it was part of this national network of women's bookstores. Um, it was a place where not only did you have access to materials, written materials, but it also became a dynamic community place. Uh, lots of coffee shop kinds of discussion activities and talk. Um, but again, uh, without solid financial resources, often the kind of endeavor that would eventually fade out and because women couldn't afford the resources it took to keep a, an enterprise like that going. Um, so the Lincoln Legion of Lesbians, better known as LLL, um, also had an impact uh, on bringing some uh, resources, some opportunities to the Lincoln community that we wouldn't have had otherwise. So for example, Sinister Wisdom, I, I'm one of the lesbian journals that came into being after Amazon Quarterly folded on the West Coast. Um, Sinister Wisdom, the editors, um, to Catherine and Harriet, very delightful, very bright, hardworking women, moved to Lincoln and published the journal from Lincoln for a period of years. Uh, in fact, I did some photographic covers for them. I knew some people who participated in um, the editorial and writing process, not just as authors, but also as um, production managers here in Lincoln. So it was all very, um, very exciting and interesting and came very much as a result of Sarah Hoagland, Julia Penelope, a number of people here in the Lincoln community and who were at UNL um, at the time. Of course, it was a very hostile environment. Um, Julia Penelope left, Sarah Hoagland left. They didn't all leave at the same time, nor did they leave for the same reasons, but um, it, it was difficult for radical women scholars to find their way within the university. And everyone had to figure out not just how the academy operates, but how one operates in an academic environment when your intent is to lob grenades into the middle of it. 
and that's again we're talking about the disruption, um, talking about um, what Dorothy Smith called fault lines. I come from Southern California, so the idea of earthquakes is very um, appropriate from my perspective for thinking about how you shift a university, not only in terms of its scholarly work, but in terms of how we work with our students, um, our pedagogical strategies in the classroom, all of this is disruptive and takes some way of supporting people as they're doing this. And I see women's studies and today women's and gender studies as having that capacity to support people. We can't always make it um, a welcoming environment in and of ourselves. You can't change an entire university community, but you can create a safe haven or at least a place where people can come together and, and struggle with ideas, struggle with practicalities. You know, do we accept money from an organization or from a celebrity or from a component where we know that women's lives are not fully valued? Do we take those resources? What do we, where do we draw our ethics? Where do we think about the relationship between uh, the grading process or the admissions into graduate programs? These are all areas of struggle that are distinctive when you bring the feminist set of lenses to them. And going back to community engagement, yes. I was thinking about you know your own, uh, perhaps it's your own personal engagement. I don't intersect with your scholarly work, but you spoke that, about being on the Lincoln Women's Commission. I was on the Women's Commission for a period of time. Um, I was interested in being on the commission because of my work with the Rape Spouse Abuse Crisis Center, Voices of Hope Now, and my interest really was in understanding more about at the community level how decisions are made about funding. You have you know joint budget committees between the city and the county. You have state money. You have programs that might overlap but that serve distinctive populations or have distinctive missions. And how do you help those programs to find their place within the community and make those contributions when at the same time there are politics involved with it, there are um, dynamics that bring people into sharp uh, conflict with administrative structures, with bureaucracies, with law enforcement, with legislators how do you negotiate those positions? So, yes, I think um, community involvement is where we see feminist theories in practice and we can test whether or not they're useful at this particular moment in time with this particular set of issues that are in front of us. Um, we can't find the answers to make those changes without engaging in community change. One of the frustrations that comes from reading, viewing, engaging with people around the country is seeing that some communities are making steps forward when we are not and other communities are taking steps backward and we're not challenged with that at the same point in time. Um, and so I, I see the women's studies program as having 
a capacity to help foment and learn with our students who are going to be the community in which we live and for them to have those skills. So if we want to see social change, if we think about it abstractly, that doesn't help us understand how it's going to be sustained beyond our individual efforts. Um, I've worked in the area, I've volunteered in the area of domestic violence, sexual assault. I don't do research in the area. I learned at my university in the 1980s, we did a series of studies of safety on campus for women, faculty, staff, students. We identified what were the buildings that were unsafe, what were the concerns that women had going to the library, what were the concerns that differed for the residence halls and those in the Greek system. We did all of that research. It wasn't publishable. You don't make a scholarly name out of that. You do it off your back. Um, off our backs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the way in which we n learn more about our own community, our own environment. Um, that you know, you you can tell the students that we have cameras in the library, but the violent, the women against violence against women group on campus was able to get people to the table to admit that there was no film, that the cameras were just mock-ups, and that the sense of security that one might have from a camera is not going to move us forward in terms of addressing the concerns that students had on campus. So, um, I wonder uh, should happen now. If you had, if you were going to give advice, which maybe you do in your classes, uh, to young people today, you know, what are the challenges you see now? How do you see? What do we need to do uh, at this point in history? Certainly, we need to get engaged. And as feminist pedagogy guides me, I try to have my students engaged in the community as a regular part of their classroom activities. I make those options available to them, recognizing that our students have lots of work hours and lots of family responsibilities that might not allow that. But when possible, that that is the best way to not only learn about their community and make a contribution, but also to understand the levels of challenges that exist. That we may have a very um, clear idea of what we believe should be happening in the relationships between budgets, law enforcement, housing, um, homeless situations, but when those come together in a case of a domestic violence, interpersonal violence um, situation, that each of those is going to present challenges and we're going to have to be able to understand those and reach out and find allies in each of those arenas in order to be effective advocates, in order to be helpful in moving the community forward. So. The Women's Studies program in the, for the future, I think, is on solid ground in, in terms of that understanding. Some of our students are engaged in scholarly research that doesn't have a community activism component to it. They may be engaged in literary studies, they may be doing social science research in a laboratory, whatever it might be. But as part of a women's studies program, they understand 
the dynamics of a community or an internationally that information flows into them that is affected by patriarchal relationships, politics, and that they're going to have to, they're going to have to work their way through that. Um, much more difficult today in a media that is controlled by a very small number of very influential and politically motivated actors. I would like to see many more feminist journalists. I would love to see a women's journal advocate reconstructed to give an opportunity for women and men in the community to come together and talk about and share with other people uh, in the community and their legislators and their law enforcement and their landlords um, these dynamics and how they continue to affect our lives. We have a lot of you know, blowback that comes against uh, feminist initiatives, feminist analyses, and our, our goal is that we, we have the tools to understand and grapple with and challenge those and change those. Um, that's where we have a future in women's studies and it comes through our students. It comes through the work that we do together with them. I do hear from our students, they, they reach a point either as undergraduates or sometimes as graduate students where they're very frustrated with having to turn around and work with people who still don't get it, who still don't understand the dynamics of patriarchy, of capitalism, of heterosexism. And I'm very, I don't get frustrated with that. I do understand that they want to move forward. They don't want to move backward. But as an educator, I know that someone was there, maybe it was the women in the community in Lincoln, maybe it was other women's studies faculty members, maybe it was other women's studies students, they helped me move. And so that's where our future is, in helping people move forward, helping them to come to grips with what is oftentimes a very difficult reality. How are we doing? That's it's <laughs> fabulous. What? Uh, oh, I guess we're about over time. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, what else would you like to add? You know, um, a memorable story or yeah. uh, just advice or anything. <laughs> One of the it, we've had a number of um, Midwest feminist conferences, which are now called the No Limits conferences. Yeah. Uh -huh. We've had those for a period, actually, throughout my time here at the university. Those have always been wonderful times to come together. But I do remember a particular time when we connected with the Women's Resource Center at UNL, which at the time was a student-directed program. And they were, they were, in fact, the radical arm of women's studies because as students they often felt empowered to say and do what some faculty were reluctant to challenge within the university or in the community. And I remember at one of the Midwest Feminist Conferences um, that the Women's Resource Center ran on the basis of collective decision making, which as we know is very complicated. Um, especially when you bring together very um, engaged and forceful people. And I remember 
there was this debate going on about whether to bring Mary Daly or Pat Parker to the university. And the collective decision process just became mired in debates around lesbian feminism, uh, African American feminist movements, the dynamics of how you bring these together and where you make your priorities. And what I learned is that I am in many ways willing to let the sparks fly, but to say, let's do both and. Let's bring both of them. Let's see how we meet that challenge face to face in the context of a university that probably will be unhappy with both presenters <laughs> and, and see how that works. Of course, what that means is you have to go out and get the resources to bring both presenters, which we did. And the Women's Resource Center, the students were then, I, I'm, while they engaged in the collective process, they were able to expand their understanding of feminism and these two dynamic movements, um, whether it was a white woman representing it or an African-American woman representing it, they had the opportunities that so many students would never have. And this was, this was the result of their passion and of their commitment to keep working the process and not just give in to, well, we can only have the money for one person. Let's just disrupt the expectation that we only have so many resources. I thought that was a really good example of how student empowerment can generate opportunities that many of us as faculty members would never even contemplate. Yeah, that's so great because it's as though rather than facing a no, they they were able to say yes. You yes. Know, let's start with yes, we can do this, and let's we see how we both. can make it happen. Let's see it how we do both of yeah. these and understand that people are arguing from passionate positions. But we have room for a lot of passion. Yeah. That's great. Thank you.